Chapter 31, Genesis. Jacob begins his journey uh, back home again. So as you turn there, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at uh, Jacob's life once again. And I definitely need that. Okay. Of course, bending over, just hurting my knee, shortened the message by about seven minutes right there. No. Discussing knee issues with several of you. <laughs> but uh, all right, Jacob. Well, let's pray. Father, we just want to commit our time to you and love to study. Lord, love to study your word together. What a, what a blessing and what a joy it is. And, and to watch the progression of the faith of, uh, of men and women in the Old Testament. Uh, Lord, we just relate to them and it's, uh, it's a joy to our hearts. And we pray that uh, the lessons that we can learn by, uh, by Jacob today and his, his speech, his behavior, his faith, his courage, Lord, uh, uh, these things would be part of our lives as well. So use your word to penetrate our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jacob's uh, flight back is in certainly a type of exodus. He, he leaves uh, a pagan land and heads towards uh, the land of Israel once again after a 20-year absence, much like his grandfather had done, Abraham, uh, much like Moses would do from Egypt at a point in time, uh, leaving the past behind, going to the land God called them to. Uh, and, uh, and really, the story all began, in a sense, with uh, Jacob and his mother's deception of the brother uh, Esau, who we uh, described as a living beer commercial. We put him right up there in the Bible. There's like Judas, and then there's Esau, as far as the bad guys in the Bible. Uh, and the blessing was supposed to go to Jacob, but his father Isaac was going to give it to uh, Esau, which would have been a huge mistake. And so the, the mom and the son intervene, do a little switcheroo, uh, and Jacob gets the blessing. Uh, downside of that, big brother wants to kill him, so now he's got to flee. And so he does that with the idea of going back to Padan Aran and finding a bride there. Labors for her, Rachel, for seven years. Oh, another switch. And uh, now he ends up with the older daughter, Leah, as his wife instead. Uh, and then labors uh, again uh, another seven years for Rachel. And we've kind of been through the <clears throat> four wives and 11 kids later and, uh, and trying to leave to go back to the promised land. Uh, Laban basically says, well, listen, here's what I'll do. Uh, you can, you can uh, name your wages, continue to work, so you don't go back empty-handed, remember. And so Jacob now at a point where he's finally at that point of trusting God again and the promise God made to him at Bethel, I'm going with you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to bring you back, <clears throat> and I'm going to prosper you. And he says that to him when he's on the run and in sin and not really, really expecting God to show up and bless him that way, but God does. Uh, and now he's going to return in obedience and we're going to find out that God has uh, kept his end of the bargain, his end of the promise. Uh, remember, Jacob said, uh, if you do this, then I'll do this. And God's going to come and say, it's time. It's time to, uh, to go back. One of the things to keep in mind as is, is we read this is he makes the decision to go back is that he doesn't tell Jacob. And he doesn't tell Jacob because at this point, he's pretty sure Jacob would probably kill him. Uh, so this, this is not a... This is not like when he decides to go back. Well, I, I'm pretty sure that's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, you want to stay with your father-in-law, you know, Laban who rips you off all the time and stuff. So to us in a cursory reading, it could seem like, well, that's obvious, Jacob. I'd gotten out of there a long time ago. But this is kind of a, a, a dicey deal. This is a big thing when he says, I'm going to go. I'm going to trust God. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm just going to go. But uh, that's the idea. That's what we're seeing very different in Jacob's life is uh, his obedience to the Lord. Well, let's look at the details of the decision, and there's three things that this decision hinge on in verses 1 to 16. Now, Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away uh, all, that our father, all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all his, this wealth. And, uh, and Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed, it was not favorable to towards him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance that is not favorable towards me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. 
And you know that with all my might, I've served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. And if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks were speckled. And if he said thus, the streaks shall be your wages, then all the flocks were streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at that time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see all the rams which leap upon the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he sold us, and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. So, uh, we said the decision to go is based on three things. And one is that, uh, well, uh, the change in Laban and his, uh, his sons. Laban's countenance, he said, has changed towards him. Uh, the kids are going, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we have no inheritance less because it's, uh, it's, all, <laughs> it's all going to Jacob now. Uh, and they're not, real, they're not real thrilled. They're not like just praising the Lord. Isn't that amazing that the God of Jacob, every time dad changes his wages, he causes all of the new offspring to be what would go to Jacob. It's amazing how God has worked in Jacob's, uh, Jacob's favor. I think we should get to know this God. He's a miracle working God. He's a God that blesses those that are obedient to him. And Now, they're not really saying any of that. They're just saying, pretty sure we should kill this guy or something because uh, we're losing everything here. And, uh, and, uh, and so all of that is part of this. The second part of the decision to go is because it's the Lord, the Lord that uh, uh, told him to go. But notice that Jacob is saying over and over again, Laban did this, but God did this. And Laban said this, but God said this. There's a real change here for, for Jacob. Uh, he's really, uh, really growing in his, uh, his faith. And he's remembering, and God reminds him of the vow back in that story of Bethel, where he said, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. He's got a little more than food to eat and clothing to put on. He's a wealthy man uh, at this point. And it's very obvious to him, it didn't have anything to do with his little striped sticks. <laughs> Remember, he, cock, he comes up with this whole deal that, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll just carve the little sticks, put little stripes on them, and then, you know, the lamb, the, the rams and so forth, and look at those, and then they'll conceive striped sheep. Oh, yeah, that just happens all the time, Jake. I don't know how he comes up with that, but he comes, but he's not there, you know, so that's not there anymore. He's not saying, and sometimes he's changed my wages, and I, I made different colored sticks, and that's uh, how we're doing so well here. That, that's, that's no longer part of, uh, part of Jacob uh, at all. Uh, he sees God is in the midst of, of everything. Uh, but the decision to return is also based on his conversations with Rachel and Leah. He has to actually legal, legally bring them in. We know that the, there was a Mesopotamian legal code that stipulated that wives could not be taken out of that region and that area without their consent. Uh, certainly nor would he want to. And so he kind of rehearses. This is what we've been through. Your dad has changed my wages and so forth. And, and they're like, well, it's not going real well for us either. You remember the dowry that you worked for, the double dowry you worked for each of us? Well, that took, that went to Vegas, man. It's gone. You know, I don't know. He went to Vegas, but it's gone. He's consumed it. It's, uh, it's, no, longer the, it's no longer there. Uh, and, he, and he treats us like, like uh, strangers. The idea of the dowry, the dad would take the dowry given by the prospective uh, husband, <clears throat> and he would hold it in trust uh, in case uh, there was an untimely death, she becomes a widow, there's money now to support her, is the, is the idea built into the, the whole cultural thing. The money is given to the father, but it's actually set aside 
you know, for the wife at a, at a time that she would need it, and that's all gone. So uh, these two gals finally are in agreement about something. Whatever God says, <coughs> do it. Uh, notice his concluding statement there in verse 9. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them uh, to me. And that's become very uh, obvious to, to everyone uh, and uh, even to Laban, as we'll see, even to his sons, to the two daughters, that whatever, whatever happens to Jacob, God is the one that's in control, miraculously making sure that Jacob gets his wages. And, and we'd say that, you know, sometimes when God is asking us to do something, he often prepares our hearts for it. You know, it's like they're seeing that this is really going bad here, you know, and uh, we probably should do something. Uh, we probably should be making a change here. And then God says, move, go, change. And, uh, and God even, in a sense, conditions their hearts and get them ready for what he's going to ask them to do. And, uh, you know, it wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't an easy decision because uh, we'll see they have to actually flee for their lives. So he makes the decision to return home, but he's going to obedience to God. And, uh, and then Jacob departs, and we would say it's in, in haste. Verse 17, then Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on Maseratis, or sometimes called camels. And he carried away all of his livestock and all of his possessions, which he had gained. He acquired livestock which he had gained in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. <clears throat> and Jacob stole. There's a lot of stealing going on here. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, and that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all he had. He arose, crossed the river, headed towards the mountains of of Gilead. So one of the things we note, if you're a Bible underliner uh, there in verse 21, is that he arose and he crossed the river. And uh, uh, Moses makes a point of including that so that we'll remember what it means to cross the river. These are called the Hebrew people because of a man named Eber, a descendant of Shem, who crossed the river, left all the Babylonian gods behind, all the idols behind, and cross the river to worship the one true God. <clears throat> and every time we have a reference to them of them moving towards Israel uh, and moving towards the west and crossing that river, uh, it's an indication that they're doing so <clears throat> in obedience to God. We know that he departs in an opportune time. Sheep sharing in, uh, in Mesopotamia would happen in the spring. It would be a good time to leave. <clears throat> they're not going to depart in the dead of winter with uh, all of these flocks and children and, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> and what would happen with Laban, he and his sons would leave the home, go to the place where they would do the shearing, and they would be there for several sons. We have uh, one uh, tablet from that area of this time period that indicates uh, one shearing that took 400 men a three-day period to complete. I don't think Laban's got 400 guys, so it's, uh, it's going to take a while. We can almost calculate how long it took them uh, because as we continue the story and Laban is in hot pursuit, uh, it, uh, he seems to catch them rather quickly uh, given the fact that he would have had to move 440 miles a day for seven, uh, seven days there, or about 10 days to get there. Uh, pretty good for a guy that's 150 years old. I'm not really sure that even Charlie could move that fast in his brand new car. But uh, nonetheless, now that I've distracted you, nonetheless, uh, it's because of the fact that it's an opportune time. Uh, they are away, and they will be away for weeks. It's in the spring. It's a good time to travel. He's going to do it. They've been waiting for this moment, again, because they have to flee. They're not just going to you know, pack up one morning and get a couple miles down the road and have Laban uh, catch them. They're trying to get back to Israel before uh, he comes on the scene. So there's a word play in verse 19 and 20. Uh, uh, again, the idea of stole or stole away or the stole the heart of. Uh, and, uh, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And I know I would used to uh, read this and <laughs> kind of think, what is up with, <laughs> with Rachel, you know? And, uh, you know, you would, you would be hoping that in the midst of the miraculous that she's living in, uh, and with the growing faith of her husband, how, how, however crazy uh, their own um, 
lives and household are with all those kids and all those wives and, and, and all of the disobedience that lit up to get to that point, uh, that perhaps uh, coming to know God would, uh, would have happened at this point. Well, what she stole was uh, referred to as teraphim, and it's little household gods, and they would be in human, human form. We've, uh, archaeologists have uh, uncovered them, uh, along with uh, some other tablets called the Nuzi tablets, uh, that talk about the fact that whoever possessed the family gods possessed the inheritance. It would just be like the deed, the will, the trust. She takes that, apparently, so that she has proof that all these sheep, all they have is actually hers, it's their family's, it's no longer Laban's. Uh, the other reason that she may have taken it is because she feared that her father Laban uh, would use these for uh, uh, divination, to inquire of his gods to find out where they've gone, what routes they've taken, and, uh, and track, them, track them down. And we've already seen that Laban is into divination uh, in one of the previous chapters. So uh, she takes it for those things. It also, as we will see uh, later in the chapter, uh, it's an indication of actually her contempt for these gods. Not that she's interested in them, talks to them, worships them. Uh, we'll see that she has absolute contempt for these, for these gods. But nonetheless, we'll see this issue arise again because she's taken them. Now notice also there's, a, there's a really a pattern of alienation uh, that's here in the text. Notice that Laban is no longer Laban the father of. Now he's Laban the Syrian. Some texts would say Laban the Aramean. But he's not somebody's father-in-law. He's not somebody's dad or father. He he's, has a complete different identity being emphasized. We see that in verse 20. Two different distinct pe people, two different distinct people groups. The tension uh, is rising. And again, they need to depart in haste. Why? Because every time... Jacob brings up the idea of departing. Laban's got some other deal. Well, I think that's a great idea. Now all I want you to do is this, as he did uh, previously setting up his wages, uh, as we saw in the previous chapter. So he makes a decision to return home, and it's in obedience to the Lord, and everything has changed about, uh, about Jacob and his vocabulary, what he has to say, that it's all God, what God is doing him. We really don't find. I mean, I've kind of had to re repent of uh, calling Jacob a dirty, sneaky thief, uh, given the fact that what we're finding in the text is that it's his uh, brother, Esau, the living beer commercial, that makes the reference to him being dirty, sneaky thief. Uh, it, which uh, there's not a lot of credibility with that guy. Uh, so, you know, it's really, it's not really the right uh, representation of who the guy is. Uh, yeah, he was part of that deception with his mother. His mother, you know, again, Rebecca, believing that she was doing God's will and helping God's out, uh, God out, we'd say the end never justifies the means, but she believed that it did in that sense. Her high, we'd say her heart was in the right place. He was part of that, got him in a lot of trouble as a result of that. But ever since then, and we're going to see when he comes to defend his integrity, pretty honest guy, pretty hardworking guy. No rebuke from the Lord ever for any of these things. In fact, what God says about him is that, Jacob, I've loved. Uh, so a very different pic picture than maybe what we've had uh, in the past just from our study together. Uh, but again... He leaves in obedience to the Lord. He departs without a word to Laban. Now notice that Laban's determined to regain all that was lost, verse 22 to 35. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days, uh, seven days' journey. And he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. Uh, but God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad, so Laban overtook Jacob, and now Jacob pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban and his brother pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs and tremble and harp. Probably not, but I might have. Uh, and you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Uh, now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, Be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad, 
And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Kind of, he was probably tracking right along until he said that. Verse 31, then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I said, perhaps uh, you would take your daughters from me by force. With whomever you find your gods, do not let them live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, into the two maids' tents, but he did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of woman is with me. And he searched, but did not find the household idols. So Laban's, again, determined in his pursuit of Jacob. Uh, we see that in verse 22. And again, we have this thing. It was on the third day, and he pursues him for seven days. How does he travel uh, that far, that fast? Or how does Jacob with all the herds and the children and, uh, and so forth? And it's, uh, it's probably because, because he could make, uh, we're told, about six miles a day. Uh, it's probably because he's left weeks before they ever get back from, uh, from shearing the, the sheep. And, of course, with uh, uh, Laban, he's traveling with uh, probably uh, lots of well-armed men uh, traveling fast, and they're able to, uh, to close the gap. But they don't get there until they've actually arrived in the mountains of Gilead on the northeast side on the Damascus Road coming down, and they're pretty much back in the land of Israel at this point. But they really are a posse. Look at the verbs in verse 22 to 25. Fled, pursued, overtook, and pitched tents. They are all military terms. Uh, so they, they are really out after him. Uh, and uh, this is not going to be a peaceful uh, meeting. But what stops Laban, of course, is God intervenes. Uh, we love those verses. Look at verse 24. But God. It's like things are looking really bad. But God. But, but God was there. Uh, in Jacob's words before that we'll talk about uh, towards the end of the message, God was overseeing. God saw my affliction. God, God saw. Laban tried to do this, but God did this. It wasn't looking too good for me, but God intervened in this way. And God intervenes. And, of course, Laban, God appears to him in a dream. Laban has watched the miraculous of these herds uh, multiplication over the last uh, seven years. When God appears for him and says, don't do anything, basically he's saying, if you harm him, you're in big trouble here. And, of course, Laban says, well, now I believe in the one true God. I get down on my hands and knees and I repent. Before. No, it's interesting. You know, we always think, you know, if people would just see miracles, you know, that would be enough. You know, miracles aren't enough. You know, people need to be convicted of their sins so that they want a Savior who can forgive them of, of their sins. This guy had watched the, and seen the, the miraculous uh, many, many times. Uh, I was um, in India a number of years ago and preaching, and we were doing an outdoor thing. And, and, uh, and afterwards, a bunch of people got, got saved. And it's interesting, the little household gods, the, in the translator I was working with, tells them, and he's explaining to me what he's doing. All the people that came forward, they're like 20, 30 people that came forward. We're, we're like, uh, you know, out on a, you know, this is like a dirt field with a couple of fluorescent lights. It's not in a big arena here. You know, we're just, we're in the middle of no, nowhere. You have a little amplified music and some fluorescent lights. They're like, should we go back to the mud hut and the candle tonight? Or should we go down and see what that music is about? And, uh, you know, so you can draw a pretty good, uh, good crowd. And it was an amazing uh, uh, to see how many people came forward. And the guy tells him, I want you to take all of your idols now and throw them up on the stage. Those things that you've lived in great fear all of your lives. And they're like jerking them off, chains off their neck, pulling them out of their pockets. These little statues about this big. And they showered our feet, all these little silver and gold and brass uh, idols. And I thought, one of those would make a nice souvenir, but I wasn't going there. But, uh, <laughs> but, I was, but it was just like, this is all happening. And, uh, and then the guy, you know, he, he starts stomping up and down on him. See, you don't have to fear. The God you serve is the God is above all God. And we go through this whole thing and pray with him. And then the, there's healing lines. And pray for this, uh, this one guy that brought his son forward that was about, uh, you know, I, I think about four or five. I just remember at the time, 
uh, he was Josh's age, my son's age, and he was deaf and dumb. He couldn't speak, couldn't hear, and uh, and we prayed for him. I prayed for him, and and, uh, and the, was I tell you, it wasn't my great faith. The translator says, "Why don't you tell him to say something?" And so, very good idea, you know, say something, speak, you know, and then uh, could have gone on TV or something. But uh, you know, I wasn't quite that dramatic. But uh, uh, and the kid speaks. Uh, and I remember the first thing he said was afta, which means dad or daddy. Uh, first time his dad ever heard him say a word. And clap, see if he can hear, and he could hear. And uh, it was really, it was really amazing. It was a just total miracle. And that dad went away a happy Hindu that night. You know, you, you think, your kid getting healed miraculously, that guy would get saved right on the spot. Uh-uh. Interesting. People need to be convicted of their sin in order to desire and want a savior uh, in their lives. Laban doesn't come to faith. Saw the miraculous, God appears in a miracle. It wasn't enough. Laban's determined to question Jacob's uh, integrity. Notice the series of questions. <clears throat> what have you done that you've stolen away unknown to me? Why have you carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? And as we mentioned, but this idea, and why did you steal my gods? It was like, whoa, 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 back up, back up right there, you know. Uh, and, and so he jumps in and says, well, listen, you find any household gods with us, just kill that person. You know, little knowing that Rachel had taken uh, the, the household gods. Uh, and certainly Laban would have never expected Rachel <coughs> to have had them because, well, he would have never looked because she was sitting on them, which would be, very sacrilege. I mean, these are your little idols. These are your gods. <laughs> it's not too friendly to sit on them. It would have been a very sacrilegious thing. Is she just sitting on them? No, she makes another little comment, doesn't. She's at that time of the month where she would be considered, in that culture, unclean. By sitting on them, she's saying these idols are unclean, worthless. That's her statement. <laughs> and... and uh, and Laban would never conceive his daughter making a statement like that. So he never says, well, I get up. I'm searching there anyway. She's, she says, I can't get up. He goes, well, that's all right. Search everywhere else. He comes out uh, determined to gain all that was lost. But God intervenes, speaks to him in a dream. Nobody's weapons are, are being taken out here. Uh, and uh, Jacob's probably feeling it a little bit here. In verse 36, and he's going to begin to defend himself uh, in his own integrity. And what we're going to hear is, is 20 years <laughs> of putting up with this guy, his lying, his cheating, his betrayals. And, you know, this is the guy that switched the two daughters uh, on the wedding night. This is the guy that switched his wages 10 times. This is the guy that required him to pay a double dowry for every daughter. And this is the guy that he had to flee and run from, from fear of life. And Jacob's kind of like, I'm pretty sure God's with me here, and uh, I'm going to kind of let you have it here. I'm going to tell you, you're the cheat, you're the thief, you're the schemer, and you're accusing me. This is what he says in verse 36. And then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that you've so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren, your brethren, that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young. And I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beast." I did not bring to you, I bore the loss. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day, the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house twenty years. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times, unless the God of my father the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac. Notice the word fear is capitalized. It's a, it's a name for God. It's the fear uh, of Isaac had been with me. Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. 
So he kind of unloads on them, gives them this little tongue lashing. But it's, it's really, a, we'd say, a righteous indignation. Sometimes when we get angry and we unload on somebody, it's because of my deal and what I want and how I'm hurt and I want to let you know it. But actually when you're, you get angry for the Lord's sake uh, or for somebody else who can't stand up for themselves, that, that's a whole different thing. There was a, a popular author a number of years ago that wrote a book called A Time for Anger. It was about the abortion issue. He just thought it was about time Christians got pretty ticked off that they might get motivated and, uh, and do something uh, and stand up for the, uh, the unborn. That's what's going on here. Notice he, at the end, it's all about the Lord. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, that's why I'm standing here uh, today. So he defends himself uh, by giving uh, a history of his own faithfulness, uh, 20 years of anger coming out here, as we see in verse uh, 36. Jacob saying, me dishonest. You're the one that's actually the, the cheat. And he defends himself, as I mentioned, by mentioning God's protection. Verse 42, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. This is, a, in a sense, a God-honoring Spe little speech that, uh, that Jacob is giving here. Uh, again, the kind of anger here is what we would call a righteous indignation. He's attempting to glorify God, give all the credit to God. He affirms the fact that God saw you every time you lied to me. God saw you every time you cheated me. God saw you when you betrayed me. Now keep that in mind as we get to that. Jacob at this point could have said, yeah, God, you saw that and you did nothing. And just let, let all this happen to me. So he could have been a very bitter person at this point, but he's not. He sees all the bad stuff and says, but God was there. And if God allowed it, he had a reason. And if I look to him, his promise said, he'll take me, he'll bring me back, he'll be with me. I'm going to hang on to that. I'm going to keep seeing that ladder to heaven, ascending and descending in those angels, access and availability to God. If you do this, you'll be my God. I'll serve you. I'll give you a tenth. I'll do those things. And that's, that's where Jacob has uh, landed at this point. Well, let's go to this last part, verse 43 to 55. Laban and Jacob devise a covenant based on their mistrust one to another. <clears throat> Laban doesn't know what to say, so he just comes up, well, let's have a covenant here then. <laughs> and, and, uh, and there's a real different look at how Laban wants to do this and how Jacob wants to do it. And Laban answered, verse 43, and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters. These children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. But <clears throat> what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne? Now, therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob is the initiator. Jacob took a stone, set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it, uh, this is Laban's name, Yagar Shahadutha, but Jacob called it uh, Galiad. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name is called Galiad, also Mizpah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond the heap to you and you will not pass beyond the heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Again, a proper name for God. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all the night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and daughters, and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. So Laban picks himself up off the ground after a little tongue lashing by, uh, by Jacob. Needed to say something. He says, let's form a non-aggression pact here. <laughs> We're going to make a little boundary. 
basically the entrance from Damascus in that area into the land of Israel. We'll make a little boundary right here. You don't go beyond it. I won't go beyond it uh, uh, either. Establish this covenant. So we'd say that they both devise a covenant and it's symbolized by a monument. Verse 45, they took a stone. And remember, Jacob certainly is thinking about the incident with God at Bethel, where at that point, after that dream and the vision from God, took a stone, he set it up, uh, and made his vow to the Lord. And we see him doing that uh, here. And then he says, gather stones and, and make a heap. And so he's got these two monuments there <clears throat> that would symbolize this covenant or this treaty. And we see really two independent groups of people as a result. Two, two meals, two stone memorials, two names for the memorials, and two different deities named, two different ethnic groups that come out of this. What I meant to Jacob was, Again, he was recalling God's faithfulness to him by setting up the stone. And uh, we also note that the covenant will be remembered by, by different names. Now, Laban's name is Yagar Shahadutha, <coughs> which is Chaldean, Babylonian. So he comes up with a pagan name for it, which doesn't surprise us, given what we've learned about Jacob and his spirituality up, up to this point. Uh, Jacob jumps back in and goes, that's not really going to work for me, uh, calling it after, uh, uh, you know, some Babylonian name, some Babylonian god, whatever you've come up with. So he gives it a Hebrew name, Galiad. They both mean the heap of, of witness. Laban evokes two different uh, deities. Notice verse 53. The god of Abraham, uh, the god of Nahor. Now, again, who, the god of Nahor was a Babylonian god. And the god of their fathers. Who was that? That was another Babylonian god. J, uh, Jacob ignores that, and he comes up with his own formula. He says, and, and he swears by the fear of his father Isaac, again, a proper name for the, the name of God that we saw in the previous passage. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice. What's he doing there? Well, remember, he made a vow to God. He said, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you'll keep your word to me, you'll go with me, You'll be with me. You'll watch over me. And just give me food to eat and put some clothes on my back and get me back here again. You'll be my God, and I'll give you a tenth of everything. And he started it right here as he makes this sacrifice uh, to the Lord, a, a significant one to, to feed uh, all, of these, uh, all of these men and women and children that are, that are there. And he's able to say to Laban, I don't trust you, Laban, but I trust God. You know, you can say you won't break this barrier. You won't come down here after me anymore. But you know what? I don't trust you, but I trust God, that God will watch over me. God will protect me. God's the one that's been always faithful to my word. How do you get over 20 years of pain, 20 years of betrayal, maybe 20 years of anger and bitterness? 20 years of one day I'm, I'm going to get mine. One day I'm going to enact my own vengeance here. I don't know what Laban thinks he's getting away with, but one of these days. The thought had to occur to Jacob on many occasions. But he says, I'm, but I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm past that. This place becomes known as Mizpah, the watchtower, or the witness. And he's saying that God is the witness at this point. God will deal with you. You cross this line, it won't be me. It won't be me. I'm leaving you behind. And all the bitterness and all the anger and everything that you've laid on me, I just see what God did for me and what God's brought me through and what his promises are to me, and I'm moving forward. And I'm leaving this here, Mizpah. God is a witness. God will enact whatever vengeance is necessary, but it's not going to be at my hands. I read an article this week by a theologian named uh, uh, Mirzalov Wolf. And um, I'm kind of betting that nobody here speaks Croatian, so uh, maybe, maybe I came close to that, uh, that name. Wolf, I don't think I could mess that up. But uh, uh, he, he was a guy, he has an article called Free of Charge. And he said uh, he dealt with for years, even as a believer, uh, even as a theologian, uh, this idea of vengeance and that God could be a God of vengeance. And this concept and idea bothered him because it seemed to go completely against the idea that God is a God of love. And uh, how can a God of love enact vengeance? Uh, and then he said, 
uh, in the article, quote, my last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was uh, uh, a, causal, uh, a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia. The region from which I come, according to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed, over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed, my people shelled day in and day out, some of them brutalized beyond imagination, and I could not imagine, uh, I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade, in the past century, where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to that carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion, by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness, wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. And therefore, vengeance is mine. Thus saith the Lord, I will repay. All that terrible stuff you hear about on the news every night, God will deal with it, all of it, every bit of it. Everything that somebody did, said to you, hurt you in some way, at some time in the past, God saw it. Jacob said he saw my affliction, and God says, I'll deal with it. But you could actually come to a place like Jacob where you say, hey, Mizpah, this is it. This is where I kind of leave this, this behind. But God is the one that will judge between us. God is the one that will deal with this whole situation. It, it's very interesting, this whole, uh, it's called, actually called a mispah benediction sometimes. Uh, the Lord watch between me and thee when we're absent from one another. <laughs> it's uh, sometimes engraved on wedding bands. That's not the idea here. <laughs> guys pretty much hate each other. I don't trust you. You don't trust me. Don't go past this. Uh, uh, kind of uh, misappropriated on uh, <clears throat> more than one Christmas card. But it is the idea that any judgment or vengeance is going to be extracted out by God in, in the end. It's why Jesus could instruct us in Matthew 5.11 on the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. One of those guys was a guy named Jacob, who, who we see as, really as a great prophet in chapter 49. And Jacob was a guy that was persecuted and betrayed, but he was able to let it go at this point as he follows God and comes back into the land. And his life in this whole chapter and this whole thing is about he gives God the glory, the credit for, for everything. As I said, he could have been a, a pretty bitter guy at this point. But, uh, but he didn't see it that way. For him, it was all about God's, God's faithfulness. And um, I think that's a great lesson, what we do with the anger in our own hearts, uh, the bitterness, the, the betrayal we may have felt over something, is to be able to see that God will deal with it. And God is just, but we can turn and go on and, and walk with the Lord. Trust his promises to us. Well, let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that uh, Jacob is turning a corner. And uh, <clears throat> it's fun for us to w watch him grow in his faith. It's fun for us to watch him mature and do the right things and say the right things. Lord, because it gives us hope. Because so often we're, we're like Jacob and scheming to try to make it work out on our own, to try to bring things about in a favorable way. And Lord... Uh, so many times it's just about our learning to submit to you, to trust you. And uh, Lord, I pray that we could just learn to do that through the example of, of Jacob. Lord, I pray that uh, if there's anything in our hearts this morning that needs to be, well, mispot, left in a place where God says, I'm going to deal with it, I'll watch over it, I got your back. You can kind of move on with me. I pray we'd be able to leave those, those things there. Fears of the past or things that might come back. And Lord, we'd be able to entrust them to you. To know that 
we have the greater promises than even the promise Jacob had. Lord, that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. Surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, the words of Jesus to us. You are faithful to complete the work that you began in us, Paul says in Philippians 1.6. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, Romans 8. We could go on and on, Lord. Your faithfulness to us, your promises to us. Lord, help us to look to those things, hold on to those things, that we might, like Jacob, grow and trust. And when you speak, obey. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.